Good morning, everyone. I will get started now. Welcome for, to this webinar. Thank you for attending. It's the uh, 11th webinar on digitalization cybersecurity, the importance of supply chain security. It's an often ignored aspect of cybersecurity. Uh, my name is Johanna Kolomansvenen, and I am a senior program coordinator at the United States Energy Association on the Energy Utility Partnership Program, and we are based in Washington, DC. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of having Tim Watkins from Schweitzer Engineering Labs and Sergei Galagan from Ukrenergo, the Ukrainian transmission system operator. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded and all participants are muted uh, with their video turned off. You are welcome and you are encouraged indeed to post questions either in the chat or the Q&A. Um, please do participate. We're a smaller group than a lot of webinars often are, so we'll have, you'll have a, a better chance of, getting, of us having time to answer your questions. So please think about them as the presentations uh, go on and we'd be happy to answer them at the end. I will be monitoring them and passing them on to the presenters as appropriate. Um, to give a brief background on USCA, we're a nonprofit membership association of public and private energy related organizations, corporations, and government agencies. The USCA represents the broad interests of the US energy sector by increasing the understanding of energy issues, both domestically and internationally through capacity building activities and events like this one. Um, the, series of web this, the series of webinars are, um, is financed through our cooperative agreement with USAID, um, which is the Energy Utility Partner Pro Partnership Program I mentioned earlier, and in particular through USAID's Global Energy Division. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the 11th webinar in our series on digitalization and cybersecurity. And you can find the recordings of past webinars on our website, and um, which looks like this, and it's at usca.org slash events. You can find um, the recordings there, and we will also be uploading a recording of today's uh, um, webinar and um, together with PDFs of the presentations. Um, please join us. As I said, this is a series of webinars. This is the 11th. We have another four coming up in the following Thursdays. So please join us as we cover other areas of cybersecurity of importance to all of you who are working in this uh, industry and trying to strengthen the security and reliability um, of electric utilities. Next, Jamila Amodeo, Senior Energy Officer at USAID, um, the agency, US Agency for International Development will make some brief comments. Jamila, you're on mute. I'm muted, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Johanna. Hello and welcome to our webinar on digitization and cybersecurity series under the Business Innovation Partnership Initiative. October is the Cybersecurity Awareness Month. This year's theme is Do Your Part, be cyber smart. This theme encourages individuals and organizations to own their role in protecting their part of cyberspace, stressing personal accountability and the importance of taking proactive steps, steps to enhance cybersecurity. This week's focus is on if you connect it, protect it, which appropriately fits with today's subject of the webinar, which is um, to make sure that whatever equipment power utilities procure and install needs to be safe for their power operations and for critical infrastructure overall. You may be aware that last May, an executive order was issued on securing the United States bulk power system. This has been and continues to be a very important subject addressed by power sector operators, manufacturers, vendors, and cybersecurity experts, not only in the United States, but globally. This is why we invited top industry experts and practitioners today to, to our webinar. I welcome Tim Watkins of Schweitz Engineering Labs, who's joining us from Idaho. By the way, it's 6.30 in the morning for him. And Sergei Galagan of Ukrainergo, who is joining us from Ukraine. And for him, it's 5.30 in the evening. So I'd like to thank both of you for presenting on this global platform with us. I would like to thank all of you from different parts of the world who are joining us today. 
and uh, I want to say that to echo what uh, Johanna said, we welcome your questions, value your suggestions and feedback. And I want you to know that we try to incorporate your, your recommendations, suggestions into new um, upcoming business innovation partnership program, which will support select utilities through partnerships with some of the uh, utilities that have presented in our webinar series. Um, to reflect, to show that uh, we do listen, I want to say that as an example for last week's webinar, one of the requests was to present market trends. And we're happy to let you know that following these webinars, we will host two industry panels scheduled for November 18th and December 2nd, where our um, company representatives will speak about national, uh, about market trends and latest developments in products and services. A save the date uh, note will be sent to everybody, and we also encourage you to share it with your colleagues. And now I give uh, the control of the microphone and screen back to Johanna. Thank you, Jamila. Um, I'm going to introduce the speakers now briefly. Um, Tim Watkins will be speaking first today. He is a lead product sales manager at Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories. And he joined Schweitzer as an application engineer in 2013, following 20 years of US Department of Defense experience in information technology, weapon systems, communications, infrastructure planning, cybersecurity, and leading the US Marines. He was later promoted to lead application engineer in 2017. His background includes building and securing communication networks in austere environments for combat operations and holistically reducing risk for utility customers around the world. Tim focuses on system solutions that increase cyber visibility, allowing customers to detect, mitigate, and respond to events within their control systems. His efforts help to reduce risk, increase resilience, and mature Schweitzer's best practices. Our second speaker today is Sergei Galagan. Uh, he is Chief Information Officer of the Ukrainian National Power Company, Ukrenergo. Mr. Galagan has been involved in the information technology business since the late 1990s. He has experience in project management, implementing ERP, optimizing infrastructure, and re-engineering business processes, and has been CIO of several different enterprises allowing him to develop a great deal of practical knowledge in various aspects of information technology, such as IT strategy, infrastructure and communication technology development, as well as in implementing and integrating various business applications. He enjoys IT governance and his efforts are guided by standards and best practices like ITIL and COBIT, as well as IT strategy development. He was responsible for several IT centralization and standardization projects, and one of his proudest moments came in 2011 when Sergey was awarded the best CIO Certificate of Excellence for his work as CIO of Yena Kieve Iron and Steel Works. Um, so now I'm going to turn off my screen and hand it over to Tim. There we go. Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, to the audience from attending from all, over, all around the world. Uh, today, Sergey in Ukraine and I sit in the Northwest part of the United States have the pleasure of discussing how a vendor and a utility approach supply chain security. Upon retiring from the Marine Corps career, I was lucky enough to discover Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories or SEL. We are known for relays. However, our portfolio has increased to include automation, communication, and a strong adherence in securing these systems. Our founder, Dr. Edmund Schweitzer III, is from three generations of inventors and electrical engineers. This led him to start uh, SEL in 1982 with the invention of the first microprocessor relay. Last year, Ed was in inducted into the Inventors Hall of Fame for his career and now has a name next to Tesla and Edison in the power world. Many of these things I will be talking about today will blend quite nicely with the last week's webinar from Drew Bagley of CrowdStrike and Heng Mock of Australian Gas and Light Company. I too, from a supply chain perspective, will be stressing the importance of data protection in securing our supply chain as a vendor to you as a customer. 
In order for a customer or a vendor to be successful at any type of security or risk reduction, it has to be approached from a top down as an important topic starting with the CEO, president, or company owner. This can be physical security, cybersecurity, supply chain security, security within a hiring process, data security, or ensuring uh, proprietary information is protected. While it is top-down driven, SEO likes to state that it is part of our organization's DNA in the context that everybody plays a part in it. Our analogy is quite similar to Henning Mock's training and awareness raindrop campaign from last week's webinar. I like how they get everyone involved and look at every raindrop of information is important um, in how it is part of the entire organization. SEL's approach to supply chain and security is codified in our principles of operation. We view our suppliers as part of our team and processes, and we educate them in our purpose, values, and culture. We continue to manage supply chain security based on cybersecurity's first principles established in our founding in 1982. Over the past 30 years, we have consistently emphasized the importance of securing a security in our critical infrastructure. Our comprehensive supplier diversity and risk evaluation process is designed to ensure a safe and dependable supply chain for the products that we deliver to you, the customers that trust us. Today, I'm going to focus on the importance of supply chain security. I will be talking about what SEL does as a forward-leaning vendor who has to ensure that we protect the devices our customers count on. What information you as a customer should be researching or asking companies like SEL and why it is important for critical control systems owners to include security from the conceptualization of a project. A lot of what I look, I will we'll talk about is in our latest supply chain security flyer that was attached to the page that you registered on. For a deeper dive into this, please download and read or contact me offline and we can discuss further. As a customer that has bought many different things from many different vendors during my career, the first metric I have is the quality of the products that the customer sells. To me, a high quality product is the very first level of assurance that a company already follows many security practices. Customers should have policies and processes to qualify vendors with questions that begin with, how long has the vendor had a market presence? Are they publicly or privately owned? How healthy is their business from a longevity point of view? What do customers say about them in personal or independent reviews? How long is the vendor's warranty? Is it only months or is it decades? Are customers so important to them that they will do the right thing no matter what with a no questions asked warranty? And what type of reliability indicators do they have on the products already deployed into control systems? What is their mean time between failure or mean time between return for the product line that you were considering? If something needs to be returned, what is the vendor's promised turnaround time? And what type of local or regional technical support do they offer you? in your part of the world. These are a sampling of things that should be considered by your organization to qualify a vendor before they have a chance to bid on something being put into your critical control system. The most essential step in ensuring supply chain security, cyber and otherwise, and quality is to form a lasting collaborative relationship with your vendors, integrators, or suppliers. In this case, SEL is the customer counting on the quality of our suppliers to us. SEL strives to clearly communicate our high expectations while at the same time cultivating an understanding that SEL is committed to the success of the supplier and to forming a strategic relationship that results in win for all parties. Our careful supplier selection process requires the input of SEL's research and development department, quality, purchasing, and security teams, ensuring that every supplier and component is vetted from many different viewpoints. When appropriate, we conduct on-site audits of suppliers to verify that their security safeguards and quality processes conform to our understanding and expectations, and to better understand the risk the supplier, uh, to the supplier's business model. We ensure every critical component can be sourced from at least two vetted suppliers whenever possible, and in a moment, I'll briefly describe how we control risk when we can't buy directly from a trusted manufacturer. 
We've also found it helpful to create a venue and atmosphere in which we can forge those close relationships by hosting an annual supplier conference at our headquarters. This is the background picture of that slide. Uh, though it requires a significant reoccurring investment, we found that by doing this, especially that since our conference is attended by representatives of more than 200 companies with uh, supply SEO with parts and services, we can better make those personal connections and communicate a consistent message about the way we view and manage our supplier relationships. We've done a lot at SEL to understand and mitigate risk, but fully understand that we must outpace the always evolving threat landscape. To do this, we develop and can constantly refine our supplier and part information systems. We've established various risk rating criteria, incorporating factors like whether the component, where the component is produced, whether it is commodity part, if it requires customization, and other um, specific criteria. We devote a lot of time and energy to assessing the financial health of our suppliers. As we all know, our assessment will increasingly weigh the cybersecurity health of our suppliers as a crucial factor. We constantly scan the horizon too. We have folks whose primary job is to scour the area of public and private threats and other intelligence streams to detect, analyze, mitigate, um, and mitigate potential cybersecurity or physical threats to supply chains and internal infrastructure, both at a macro level and a micro level. As an example of this, in the aftermath of the 2011 Japanese earthquake and tsunami, we quickly identified parts at risk of becoming depleted. We immediately moved to purchase additional inventory from vetted suppliers to ensure that an uninterrupted flow of SEL product while preserving our ability to ensure the authenticity of those component parts. The same can be said about making decisions during COVID. As SEL, we must ensure we get you a replacement relay or the relays that you have ordered or the parts that you, are, uh, that you are ordered from us for a critical control system immediately. We obtain components and software from local and regional suppliers whenever feasible to enhance our ability to closely scrutinize all aspects of production. To minimize the risk inherent in a complex global supply chain, SEL manufactures critical components like motherboards, um, for our computer systems and circuit boards for our electronic devices in a secure state-of-the-art facility with our with our own work and our own people and since the integrity of each of those products must be ensured until it reaches the security perimeter of our customers we apply our same supplier qualifications and scrutiny to our transportation and shipping vendors we even have some customers that want tamper protection during transit to ensure the integrity of each of our products, we start by securing the environment in which we produce them. We safeguard our physical and electronic perimeters and internal systems using an array of sensors and by constantly cultivating the strong security culture that is embedded in the SEL DNA. We also conduct exhaustive background checks of all of our employees. From there, we rigorously verify the performance of all purchased components against supplier product specifications. I mentioned supplier diversity and the redundancy earlier, and that we make every effort to have at least two vetted suppliers for each component. While we strive to purchase those components directly from the manufacturer, that's not always possible today. When we are forced to purchase from a broker or some other indirect source, our counterfeit detect detection program ensures we obtain only legitimate first quality components. We use the techniques that range from analysis of test build telemetry to x-ray inspections to an old good old-fashioned visual examination of each and every component to make certain certain that that component is exactly what we and the customer expect another important aspect from a customer point of view is the verification of the software and the firmware authenticity sel software applications and newer firmware applications can be validated using the digital signature Software and firmware are digitally signed using an extended validation code signing certificate with a key securely held in the hardware security module on the device. Older SEL firmware can be authenticated by comparison with a reference hash value available from the SEL website. SEL relays operate with an embedded environment that includes safeguards to detect alteration of programming and prevent malware infections or other corruption. 
SEL controllers use a secure embedded Linux operating system that panels applications at the kernel level to prevent alteration. No matter what may cause a part or device to fail on our 10 year warranty, we have a passion in working with you to figure out root cause. Our founder constantly asks us, why five times? And that's the only way that you can get to actually the what exactly caused it to fail. You're not just guessing anymore. We need to know exactly what is causing the issue and our customers trust us that we will do our very best to not let a single event turn into something that is systemic across our product line. If we determine a part does not meet our standards, SEL has the ability to quickly identify all the devices that may have a suspect part from say like a, a reel of diodes or transistors. Instead of being able to uh, being guessing on the batches of devices that we used a uh, certain diode or transistor on, we know exactly the serial number of the device we are looking for. Because we do not resale our devices and only sell direct from us to you, we know where those specific serial numbers were delivered, when they were installed into your system, and who is the uh, point of contact to get a hold of. We then immediate, immediately notify the, um, uh, the customers of the uh, other customers of the issues in the form of a service bulletin for a bad part, or a security vulnerability for something that may have a cyber intent to it. Additionally, our R&D and sales and customer service teams will work directly with you on how to mitigate the issue, replace the devices, or quickly develop a software or firmware update to remove that security concern. You will typically see us stop all current development and only focus on the problem at hand. And in most cases, we can have a patch delivered and tested and released to you in two to six weeks. Standards are a form of embodied technical knowledge accessible to all types of businesses that enable more effective product and process development. Innovation is how to transform novel ideas to achieve its business value. It is important to note that before you can have regulation, you have to develop a standard. And before you can have a standard, you have to have the innovation. This is typically a seven year path from the release of innovation to being codified in regulation. I state this to many of you to be careful from a customer point of view to balance your choice in standards and regulations to not slow your ability to innovate with companies like us. Um, standards that are from um, that are of the security framework variety all have significant overlap. I threw some of these up here on the slide to see just how many exist. Things that I look for that there's a balance and understanding between operational security versus cyber or technology security. Look at all the risk holistically as an organization. Do not put any risk into a silo by itself or expect uh, you need to basically, you only have so much time, talent and money in your organization. So you need to be able to balance that to the risks that are most important to your organization at this moment in time. I also look for standards concentrating on the system level implementation, vice a certifying at a product or device level. The standard is not, um, the, the standard should not be ridiculously priced for reading it or implementing it via approved third parties. And there are many free standards out there. One of them being the National Institute of Standards and Technology with the NIST 837 for risk management framework and the security controls in the NIST 853 R5. This would be an excellent starting point to begin with when selecting security controls, especially with the release of the new revision five. That includes supply chain, a new family of security controls focusing on it. Additionally, every 853 R5 security control comes with well-defined correlation control indices that assist you in auditing your system with questions that are yes, no, or not applicable. This creates for a more honest and repeatable assessment of your critical control system. Too often, I am asked by someone to add cybersecurity to this system that has been in the process of design for six to 18 months. Security of all types should be thought of from project conception to the end of the life cycle. If you begin security with the mindset that the overall cost of securing the system will significantly decrease while giving a greater uh, overall risk redu reduction, it also leads to a less complex system, 
giving the system far more maneuverability to adjust to emergency situations where the system must remove security controls to get it operational and operating uh, the power turned on again to normal operations to more secure modes as dictated by something needing to be mitigated um, building a foundation of detection or initiating a response and recovery whatever level of security is decided upon by your organization balance of cost versus security versus operational capability must all be adjusted to meet the cultural needs determined by your organization and again that must be top-down driven much of what i picture on this slide quickly ties into usea's webinar on forging cybersecurity defense for utilities with jason christopher Odregos and michael meeson from western farmers electrical co-op Things I like to see in a defense in depth or secure by design begin to get highlighted in portions of our SEL reference architecture, such as a strong line of demarcation between the control system or OT and the IT. I definitely support the concept of a DMZ here because that is where OT information here that needs to make it up to the corporate level. However, that should be a read only copy or unidirectionally moved uh, movement of the information rather than a direct access from corporate into OT. You also need to get information into the OT system as well. Firmware, software, manuals, application guides. If users do not have an easy way to do this, they will find a way to get the job done on their own. And it's usually not the secure way. Other important boundaries are segmenting human to machine activities from machine to machine and securing data information when it leaves the physical boundary of a location and moves on to a WAN link. Um, this same type of design is what we use in our manufacturing. Um, we have strong segmentation between our corporate networks, um, our R&D networks, our engineering service networks, and our manufacturing. And our manufacturing goes through the same issues of data protection and moving the data and securing that information. And we use a defense in depth posture to be able to segment each of those control systems away from each other. Finally, I will include with these thoughts about contracting language. I typically see cyber, S-I-B-R-E, purposely spelled incorrectly, put in the back of an appendix in small print with a plethora of frameworks um, that uh, the customer wants the system to adhere to. However, it was never placed in the deliverables of the contract. Even in the RFP, it was bolted on at the end as an afterthought, creates an issue for vendors or integrators. If SEO bids on a contract with a secure by design system, we would quickly outbid ourselves against another vendor bidding with bare minimums. Additionally, if we tried to add cybersecurity controls as an option, it could change or should change the overall design of the system. During the initial design of a project, customers need to determine the security framework and select the most important security controls they desire to use in that system. They already should be approaching this from a risk versus cost versus usability versus security aspect. If you ask for the system to include multiple frameworks and an implementation of thousand security controls, it quickly is going to uh, scale outside your budget. Instead, you should write the RFP stating what the minimum security controls the system should include. Enough minimums that it requires the vendor to design a proposal with security baked in from the beginning. Other security controls could be written as optional contracted line items to balance the cost of the system with future security controls that the customer would like to meet. If this is done right, Many of these security controls could be added as future funding became available with little major design systems needed to be to fulfill them. On the right hand side, I look for a solid source of procurement language guidance that includes cybersecurity. You can search for these on Google or your favorite search engine on the internet from NREL, Pacific Northwest National Labs, NERC, or Edison Electric uh, Institute all have a great starting platform of contracting language that you should be thinking about and putting in your deliverables. I wanna conclude with one last topic dealing with customer questionnaires to vendors, uh, especially since uh, these have been increasing in number with supply chain security risk concerns. We receive about four to seven questionnaires each week asking almost the same thing in slightly a different way. Some questions are very thorough, 
and may have hundreds of questions in them with a, just a twist on like combining different security controls of different frameworks into their own language. Um, this requires us a lot of time and effort from a vendor point of view to answer them all professionally. I personally believe that we should have a solid 40 to 60 questions that should be agnostic to any system. In this way, the vendor can professionally answer the questions and provide evidence of an independent assessment or certification on those answers. The customer would also be able to compare like for like answers between different vendors so they're comparing like apples with apples. I know there will always be a few questions to customer, but at least 80% of this should be solidified up front if we were able to agree as a community. My final slide is one of my most, uh, one of my most favorite rooms um, at SEL. This is a Faraday cage where we do our in-house FCC testing. This was the first, at first we did this when as an organization we outsourced it. But the time it took to get a test back was lengthy and you didn't always get all the data. It was either pass or fail. This along with other testing is such as environmentals, static discharge and vibration testing was important because we do not test to meet a standard. We test to the point of the failure of the product to ensure that we can go well beyond that standard and that we can meet each utility's requirements, whether that utility may be high humidity, high heat and salinity, or some of our colder climates with temperatures where energy must work or it is quickly life-threatening. If you ever have an opportunity to visit, visit our part of the world, please let me know and I will personally ensure that you get a tour of this building. Um, and now I get the pleasure of introducing Sergey Galligan, the CIO of NPC Ucanegro, who has taken a very solid and progressive approach from customer point of view of supply chain security. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Jamila, for introduction. Let me share my presentation and do you, do you see it? Yep, I can see it perfectly. Thank you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And let me, let me start. As uh, Jamila said, uh, I'm Sergey Galagan and I'm CIO of Ukrainerga. In my area of responsibility uh, included uh, not only uh, cybersecurity, but also infrastructure, uh, uh, SCADA systems, uh, communication systems, and many, many other, other uh, areas. Uh, let me tell you a few words about uh, Ukrainerga. So Ukraine, it's a pretty big country uh, in Eastern Europe, next to Russia and Belarus and uh, 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 Black Sea. And our company uh, is transmission system operator. It's a company who is responsible, first of all, uh, in transmission uh, electricity uh, across the uh, country. So we are uh, getting electricity from uh, generators like uh, nuclear or hydro or whatever and transmitting to uh, any point of uh, uh, Ukraine uh, whenever, uh, wherever uh, this uh, electricity needed. And then we just uh, pass this electricity to distribution system operators and they deal with it to transfer it to, uh, to uh, end users to customers. Uh, we are... Uh, operate on the whole country and we have more than 100 substations, uh, more or oh, around 20,000 kilometers of uh, electricity transmission lines and uh, peak um, uh, power uh, about uh, 23 to 25,000 uh, uh, megawatts uh, of electricity. Uh, but we are responsible not only for transmission operation. Uh, second, uh, very important, uh, our goal or our uh, mission of the company is uh, uh, balancing. So we are we are dispatcher center. We are responsible for uh, keep uh, frequency of uh, electricity network around 50 gigahertz. In, in Ukraine, we are using 50 gigahertz uh, standard, and. Uh, uh, it's uh, we, we can uh, shut down or start uh, some uh, generators from uh, other companies not uh, belong to us so we are we are commanding them to uh, say uh, take uh, some additional uh, 
power or shut down. And third uh, function which we are uh, um, uh, providing its uh, market management system. So we are, we are uh, like operator of market uh, management system for Ukraine. As uh, we are a state-owned enterprise, and uh, it's very uh, important uh, for my uh, for slides. So we are uh, owned by uh, uh, government for uh, government for 100 percent. Maybe you know that in December of 2016, uh, we was hurt uh, hardly by hacker attacks, and uh, they used uh, black energy to let's say intrude our system. And uh, actually, they um, was uh, we were able to shut down one of our substations. It's north uh, to Kiev, a uh, few kilometers from Kiev. So partly Kiev was hurt too. And uh, for uh, half uh, an hour, approximately, uh, part of uh, Ukraine was uh, shut down and blacked out. It's not uh, come to, let's say, a huge blackout, but uh, we've learned those lessons. And a little bit later, we've started uh, our journey in, in uh, cybersecurity. Uh, we've started from uh, looking for framework for standard. As Tim said, it's a, a lot of different kinds of uh, standards uh, accessible to, uh, to uh, companies to, to work with. We've uh, chose uh, ISO standards, uh, in particular ISO 27001 and uh, 27019, 19 standard more applicable for uh, energy company. So we've uh, worked with those two uh, standards. Later on in Ukraine uh, was um, published a very important uh, edict from uh, uh, Cabinet of Ministry, uh, which uh, forced us as a uh, um, state-owned enterprise and um, critical infrastructure to obey few additional rules. So we have actually uh, additional uh, framework to, to work with. We've uh, started uh, in early 2018 and developed our, let's say, uh, roadmap or uh, cybersecurity strategy, which we still uh, working on, but uh, in general, uh, we've uh, decided to divide our systems on two parts, OT, uh, operational technology, and IT. As Tim said, it's a very common uh, practice to, to divide those both. Uh, operational technology uh, network uh, mostly um, work for SCADA system and industrial automation system, so anything that can hurt uh, real equipment or electricity substations, transformers, and etc. And IT uh, network or IT part of infrastructure is for users, for ERP, for for whatever, for, for a lot of um, different uh, uh, systems or, or products. In terms of uh, cybersecurity, you could uh, look for these tiles. It's a lot of different uh, systems we've been implementing uh, since 2018. We've uh, done a lot of uh, them, but we uh, really still in progress. Uh, by the way, the data diet, it's a very important part of uh, uh, infrastructure is not implemented yet in uh, our case, but uh, it, it, it will be in, in uh, some uh, future. Uh, and uh, if you will have some questions about uh, this uh, cybersecurity architecture, I can uh, answer in uh, Q&A sessions. And uh, now I want to uh, jump to the main reason of my presentation. It's a specific uh, approach of state-owned enterprise in Ukraine uh, and energy sector within procurement uh, procedures. So in Ukraine, we have a uh, pretty uh, strict law. It's called uh, law about public procurement procedure. Any state-owned enterprise should obey this law and should uh, be stick to this very specific procurement procedure. Um, 
actually it's like uh, um, um, we should to provide a uh, very uh, uh, clear uh, RFP requirement uh, requirement from our side we should uh, provide uh, possibility to participate at least two uh, companies two vendors or two two uh, partners who can uh, go through tender procedure uh, we have uh, pretty uh, strict uh, uh, requirements for uh, the chapters uh, of uh, technical documentation which we should uh, provide for market uh, before uh, start of uh, procedure uh, any uh, part of this uh, procedure could claim uh, some request uh, to uh, anti-monopoly committee if they think that their rights was uh, harm uh, harmed somehow and uh, we also have pretty tough uh, budget procedure because we are a tariff uh, company and we have NERC too in Ukraine so committee who in charge to uh, uh, say cut our budgets uh, uh, anyway so uh, first we have a lot of uh, let's say um, problems uh, to solve to within cybersecurity because it's you know we, ukraine we have some kind of war situation with uh, russia and uh, obviously it's not uh, easy to us to to operate in such kind of environment from the other uh, side we have pretty strict uh, requirements uh, from from uh, law to uh, obey them to make those procurement to little bit uh, make little bit easier our way uh, for this um, uh, journey we've uh, invited our pre uh, pre tender uh, steps so uh, first of all as i said uh, in uh, early 2018 uh, we've uh, developed a plan or roadmap Whatever, so it's a strategy for cybersecurity um, evolution of Ukrainerga, and we created a list of uh, those systems or projects functions which we are going to implement in future in a few years. So we are somewhere in the middle of the of this uh, huge uh, program, and uh, those plan it's a document which approved by the management and a few authorities here in ukraine and uh, includes not only those tiles i, I showed you already but uh, these descriptions of functions which we are going to implement when uh, we come to next uh, to next step to next project to next function or subsystem we we are drafting list of requirements which we are going to implement uh, so we just uh, form some draft of uh, uh, request for proposals and because we uh, have to uh, invite at least two or more uh, participant in this tender procedure we uh, send out those draft to a uh, few uh, vendors mostly we are working with vendors not with um, uh, local partners or local uh, local uh, integrators or implementators we work with vendors we send out them uh, those draft of uh, requirements and when uh, and we mostly we receive uh, pretty active feedback so it's a competitive uh, market and uh, everybody wants to participate in this uh, 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 in, in this uh, procedure so we are receiving a lot of comments from them and uh, uh, often uh, those comments uh, it's uh, like uh, tries to uh, make uh, requirements more specific for a specific vendor but uh, again we should obey law and we uh, try to prepare those list of requirements as open as possible so we uh, work with uh, those um, uh, lists and 
when uh, we are pretty happy with uh, uh, this uh, uh, RFP, we just share again uh, those uh, RFP with uh, all participants and start the tender procedure. Uh, obviously, we from time to time have uh, problems with, uh, not problems, we have some claims from uh, participant, uh, they, they claim to anti anti monopoly committee to, uh, let's say, um, force us to make some uh, decisions, but we, uh, because we have an experience and we preparing each uh, procedure very, um, very uh, hard or very good. So we are ready to uh, communicate with anti-monopoly committee and um, uh, let's say uh, prove our, uh, our position. Uh, for now, as uh, I said, we've already uh, somewhere in the middle of our uh, long journey uh, and maybe even uh, far from the middle. So maybe we need um, one or two years to finish it. And uh, actually it's, uh, it is possible to make complex and uh, pretty uh, sophisticated uh, projects within um, uh, state-owned uh, enterprise environment. So that's all for my presentations and I'm ready to answer for your questions. Thank you. Jamila, Jonah. I think we still have them. Thank you. No, sorry, I, I left my little bar that unmutes me, but my uh, colleague Jake just unmuted me, so I appreciate that very much. I don't know how to get my uh, my, ca my camera back on, but uh, apologies for that. I thank you, Jake. <laughs> now I can start my video. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this webinar as much as I did. Uh, it was really very interesting to hear uh, from both sides of the supplier divide, um, the, different, uh, the different approach, the different way of looking at it, but I see uh, a lot of similarities. Um, very impressive to hear uh, from, from both of you about the uh, strong uh, emphasis on uh, quality of uh, procedures and, and um, I, I especially like the, the vendor conferences that Schweitzer is organizing. I think that's really a great way to put your money where your mouth is, not just demanding good quality, but also helping them to get there. And uh, I also like the, the, the emphasis on transparency that, that Sergey uh, was mentioning in his presentation. I just wanna make a quick plug for our webinars. Um, with respect to Sergey's remark about prudency of investment, we'll be having a webinar on that topic in two weeks, so please join us for that. Um, and I'm going to go to questions now. Um, if you haven't already, please put your questions on, uh, on, the, on the chat or on the Q&A. And let me see if I can now get to the questions. Yes, I'm on the questions now. Okay, um, so I have a question here with continuous development of new products and services. How should the buyers identify potential vendors, especially in countries that do not have mandatory standards? Okay, could take a swing at this one first. Um, from a vendor point of view, I just kind of like what I highlighted in, in, in my slides is that customers need to build a foundation of policies and procedures for their own organization. Um, but you have to balance the innovation with the standards and frameworks that you choose and the security controls that you choose. You have to think and build this in a way of having maneuverability. Um, this quickly becomes co uh, complicated with contracting rules, with diversity of product rules and vendors. Sergey hit it on it, that they cannot have a hint of favoring one vendor. But from a energy control system point of view, if I could have a homogenic upgrade of all my substations to have the exact same equipment with the exact same spare parts, the exact same trainings, 
I just reduced a lot of risk. Um, so, uh, uh, but, but you're not going to get that. Um, even if you could upgrade all your substations at once with the exact same equipment, spare parts, training, um, this becomes very difficult to do when you have equipment that takes years to install and that last 20 to 30 more years. Uh, so it, it's, it's really being careful of choosing or working with the procurement language at your country or your regulation or your, uh, um, your vertical infrastructure, critical infrastructures, uh, regulations that are involved. Yeah, that's why the, the slide you had with the standard language for procurement, I think could be really very useful to, could save a lot of people a lot of time on both sides of the divide, because if they use that standard language for procurement, then you can answer the all questions more quickly too, right? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah. I mean, we can have polished, published ones. Um, it would uh, create competition between vendors to increase the quality of their products based yeah. on, well, if SEL is doing this, then another vendor that competes with us would have to like, well, if SEL is doing it, then we have to do it too type mm -hmm. thing. Um, that one's you got to be careful with because um, that gets complicated quick in either the cost or complexity of the product. Um, uh, an example of that is say you want DNP 3SA added to your R tax and relays. Well, that's another 25, 40,000 lines of code. And now not only do you have to upgrade and patch for security vulnerabilities for DNP 3, but then when there's a DNP 3SA one, now you're also going to have to um, account for those security vulnerabilities too. So there's a certain elegance not having. It's hard for us to meet all the requirements for all of our customers all the time in different contexts. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of this sort of ratcheting up of quality that, that is a side effect of or, or a principal effect of all this competition, um, you mentioned that SEL has um, a 10 year warranty. Um, what is the sort of industry standard or, or is there an industry standard? There really isn't an industry standard, but before Edge Schweitzer came along, it was typically 90 days. Oh, wow. So um, then um, we have forced competition wise, we have forced our vendors, but I still think they're the majority of them are in that two to five year mark. Mm -hmm. um, we want that information. So we actually just still valued the warranty of a relay that was installed in the 80s. So one of the very first SEL 21s, we wanted the information. We, it's so important for us to get that device back so we can see what worked, what failed, what weathered, um, what type of environment was it in um, so that we can increase the, the, the mean time between failure and the mean time between returns of all of our products. Mm -hmm. um, a good example is that if any product that's been created in the last five years for SEL, we typically are in about a 700 years of mean time between failure. So that means if you have 700 of those devices, you're only gonna have one fail per year. And a lot of our competition or a lot of other technology companies, when you look at electronic parts, they're measuring that in hours to days. And we have pushed that out because of people using our equipment for 20 to 30 years mm -hmm. and having to rely on it. That it it may sit there and only look at information from CTs and PTs and current and power and voltage for years, but then it has to make that right decision at the speed of light in order to um, save equipment, save lives, or keep power on at a hospital or an airport. Yeah. Okay. Sergey, what do you, what is your opinion on uh, how should buyers identify potential vendors. You talked about a little bit about your process at Ukrenergo, the licitation process. Do you have anything to add there? Oops, you're on mute. Yeah, you're on mute, Sergey. Oh, thank you very much, sorry. So I would love to, let's say, choose specific vendors and specific solutions uh, for our uh, cybersecurity systems. But as I mentioned, the law in, in Ukraine uh, don't allow me to do this. And uh, every time we go for tender, like for some kind of uh, 
casino show and uh, sometimes we have uh, very uh, unexpected uh, solutions but uh, because as i told uh, we are preparing pretty tough preparing uh, the rfp for our um, systems which we are going to implement uh, the law in ukraine allow me to uh, let's say uh, disqualify uh, some bit if those bit are not cover all my um, requirements or all my necessity so in the end of the day uh, every every time i i receive uh, uh, pretty uh, good solutions from a reputable uh, vendor uh, around the world and uh, we, we, we do need to integrate them. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, um, on, on one slide of, of the team uh, was mentioned CM system. So in our case, CM, it's uh, the, the center, it's the heart of the whole uh, cybersecurity in Ukrainerga. And uh, this system should receive information from all cybersecurity and not only cybersecurity, but from many, many different system uh, in Ukrainergo infrastructure. And as a result, we need uh, to prepare or develop a lot of interfaces to connect our CM with those uh, solutions which we uh, uh, are implementing uh, additionally. So we need those information. So uh, uh, to conclude, uh, I'd love to, let's say, uh, select or pick specific solutions with specific functions, but I need to go to more smooth solutions or maybe more general solutions uh, from different uh, vendors. So for you, really, designing the RFP is, is very, it's basically your only tool for selecting vendors, right? So it's really important that you get that right. Yeah, yeah. In our case, we've mostly prepare the architecture of future solutions inside our RFP. So we need to, let's say, uh, have pretty uh, talented personnel to develop those uh, things. Yes, it's, it's, it's tough and it's long. So yeah. it's, it's not very uh, quick uh, procedures. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but critical. Otherwise you, you don't get the products you want. Your only way, your only tool. Johanna, I have one other further comment on that. As I have seen, especially in oil and um, oil and gas or refining large companies there, what they do to get around some of that is to pre-qualify yeah. devices. Yeah. So they go through an arduous testing of, say, a certain equipment that they want to use on a system, and they have they do the competition there and then they approved uh, a certain devices so that they can increase their cybersecurity. They can increase uh, the, uh, the, the, the like products as they go to, um, so their, their, their training requirements are so bad, they, can, um, they have better control, they don't have thousands of different types of devices monitoring them for security vulnerabilities or security things, they, they have a few, but there's a balance to that. Um, so for large transmission companies, we see different approaches where they either use two different types of SEL relays or they'll use an SEL relay and one of our competitors relays to monitor that transmission line because it's so important to them. And if there's a problem with the SEL one, they could switch over to the other or vice versa um, from a security mindset or just other types of mindsets. So it's kind of that redundancy in products too adds to your diversity, adds to your risk reduction, but you just require techs that understand two different types of relays, two different types of settings. It, it's, it's a real fine tuned balance and dance that you have to do. Because it can also include, increase your vulnerability because then you have two things that can get hacked and affect yeah. the system, right? But typically one of those systems is not part of the protection decision uh -huh. um, at that moment in time. So okay. you kind of, and you, if you, if you built it right with good, strong segmentation, then um, um, typically a zero day will specifically have to work on a specific device, a specific firmware version. Uh, I, I mean, you, 
an adversary has to get everything right. And that's our greatest strength on defense is when I am sneaking in from the corporate and pivoting into the OT system, making it from the OT operations center and trying to cause an effect um, down at the substation, I should have many, so many places where I have choke points that they have to go through to get caught that it is hard for them to gain a hook and um, commanding control to do something at a time of their choosing. Um, that's where that defendable architecture, that defense in depth really comes in handy. Yeah, that's something that we've been discussing and that we were discussing in an earlier webinar also. Just, you can't, any, any system is hackable. You just need to make it so complicated and have so many layers that in practical terms, it's not hackable. And but careful on the application, but go ahead, Sergey. I'm sorry. And you have to have uh, some plan how to react on uh, in case something happened. So yeah. I agree, totally agree. It's not, uh, it, it, there is no 100% guarantee that you could build a system that wouldn't be hacked at all. So it's, it's like a myth, it's, it's not possible. So you need, yeah. to, you need to know what exactly you are going to do in, in case, just in case. Yeah, 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 having a plan. Yeah, that's also another plug for our webinars. <laughs> We're also talking about that. <laughs> um, I have a question for Tim now. Um, whether or not there's been any progress towards harmonizing um, vendors' uh, requests or standards? There is, and if you look even within the United States, there are different things uh, that become important because of personalities at a different utility. Um, it's, this, is, this is kind of that plug of, I like frameworks that are at the system level and not the device level, mm -hmm. because it is impossible for us to certify our, certify our devices in every single framework that's thrown at us. Yeah. Um, there is, I had a couple interns, uh, my interns working on this, um, to try to map different security controls and different things, and as they were doing it, I watched as how I feel that so many of the different frameworks borrow from the NIST 853. So, um, and then as we were searching for that more, um, we found a website called Audit Scripts that maps about 60 different frameworks and shows you that if you meet the security controls in NIST, then you meet the ones in IE62443, which also meets the ones in NERC SIP, or and you just go down this laundry list. So what I envision would be better for a vendor to be have the most maneuverability is if I say we are on a federal agency location and we have got a risk management framework authority to operate with our devices. That means we meet this security controls, and that means that we meet these ones for NIST, we meet this ones for IE SIT 243, we meet these ones for 27000 or 27001, and you go down that laundry list. That is beneficial for everybody of the idea that a vendor would get certified in everything. It's just impossible to maintain, especially since the certifications or device certifications usually typically last only two to four years. Um, it's very costly. Um, our goals at SEL is to keep the cost of our price of our products down as much as possible. But every time you ask for something with, a, with an acronym and a number behind it, all of a sudden that is time, that is reducing innovation because that's, that's people that would have been innovating and now they're going back on previous products to, to keep up certifications. So that, that, is, that is a fine balance for, for uh, a vendor as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I have um, a question for Sergey now. Ukrenergo is a large utility. Um, do you, what advice do you have for um, smaller utilities doing the two phases of procurement that your company does? Uh, um, it's, it depends. Uh, if uh, those utility is state owned, they have no choice, actually. So they should to go the way uh, something like we've um, uh, uh, using uh, in our practice because uh, the state-owned enterprise in Ukraine uh, should uh, go through those steps. And if, yeah. huh, but uh, it's a tricky question. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm not talking about uh, only Ukraine, yes. Uh, okay, so um, I think that um, uh, working on specific and detailed requirements, it's very good exercise for your team, I mean the team inside any utility or any company to, let's say, provide very specific, really, uh, uh, requirements that we need to solve our problems. Sometimes uh, products might be very similar, uh, but some, uh, some products um, provide some special features and they may be needed or not for mm -hmm. this uh, particular uh, case. So I think that uh, every, any company, any utility should go through uh, steps of uh, discussing and uh, very detailed describing or designing the future solutions which we are want to um, acquire or want to uh, get from uh, vendors and then uh, uh, discussing with um, uh, vendors what exactly could be covered or not by uh, vendors. So my answer yes, I, I, I recommend to any uh, company to go through such kind of two-phase uh, procurement process. Uh, but again, if you are, um, uh, let's say, um, should to do uh, such kind of procurement procedure by law, you, you have no option at all. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of times it'll be very limited in, in how much flexibility they have because of procurement laws. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, here's a, another tricky question, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, we, we discussed with Tim from his, his perspective why there should be sort of standard procurement language. Um, from the perspective of utilities, would it be helpful to have a set of questions answered by vendors um, before the RFPs are issued? So that'd be a standard um, I guess, yeah, you, you'd have a very good idea and wouldn't have to ask maybe quite as many questions in the RFP. Uh, you know, in our case, it's like um, not a monologue, but dialogue. So we are uh, talking with, uh, with vendors. So we, uh, if, uh, especially in, um, if we, if we are involving uh, World Bank uh, with uh, credit financing, uh, we uh, go through uh, uh, so-called uh, pre-bid uh, pre mm -hmm. meetings and we uh, gather a lot of uh, participants, potential participants to discuss. So in our case, uh, as uh, I love to, uh, to repeat, that we are going and we want to receive best solutions for best money for Grameda. So we are trying to uh, find uh, those uh, solutions which will cover our needs. First of all, will uh, fit our uh, already uh, made infrastructure or other systems and will cost um, uh, less than, than competitors. So we are just trying to balance uh, quality and, and, and price. So uh, we, we do speak with uh, vendors uh, uh, for sure. And uh, I recommend to everybody to uh, do same, same way. So it's, it's much more uh, efficient to discuss and uh, find, uh, find some um, uh, better, uh, better solutions or better, uh, better functions before you start formal procedures. Because, because when, you start, when you already have started formal procedures, it's, it's uh, much less uh, possible ways to alter um, RFP during, during, during procedure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I um, don't have any more questions unless anybody has a last minute question. We're already a little bit over time. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I will uh, end today's webinar with, with that last question. Mm -hmm. I hope all of you enjoyed the webinar as much as I did. Uh, and um, 
At the end, you'll have an option to complete a poll. Um, and as Jamila mentioned earlier, your participation is greatly appreciated. Uh, if you have any additional comments, it, it, there's an option for comments, but if you have any additional ones, you're welcome to write to Jake or I. You'll be hearing from Jake shortly with a link to the recording of the webinar and the PDF. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, please join us for the rest of our series and have a great rest of your day or evening, depending on where you are. Bye-bye.